Good evening, everyone. My name is Elaine Howard Eklund. I am a professor of sociology and also the Herbert S. Autry Chair in Social Sciences. And I have the distinct privilege and honor of being the director of the Banyak Institute for the Study and Advancement of Religious Tolerance. We are a premier interdisciplinary research and scholarly institute at Rice University. We aim to understand the conditions which lead to religious pluralism, tolerance, intolerance, conflict, and discrimination, and then help people apply our findings in their lives and in their communities. The Institute celebrated its 10-year anniversary this past fall, and this spring starts a new initiative. The Institute will distribute an annual Senior Scholar Award to a scholar whose work is both aligned with the mission of the Institute and whose work has public reach and reception. In particular, the award will recognize excellence and leadership in public scholarship on religious pluralism and tolerance, and or work to combat religious conflict and discrimination. The scholar will visit the Rice campus for several days during the spring semester and participate in several events at the Institute and around campus, including our Reading Religion Graduate Salon, an interview for our podcast, Religion Unmuted, and interact with our students, other Institute affiliates, and community members. And it is my sincere privilege and honor to introduce you to the inaugural Baniak Institute Senior Scholar Award recipient, Dean and Professor Marla Frederick. Marla Frederick is the John Lord O'Brien Professor of Divinity and the 18th Dean of Harvard Divinity School, the first woman to hold this position in the school's 207 year history. Prior to this appointment, she served as the Asa Griggs Candler Professor of Religion and Culture at Emory University's Candler School of Theology from 2019 to 2023. She returns to Harvard, having served there as a professor of religion and African and African American studies in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences from 2003 to 2019. She is a graduate of Spelman College with a BA in English, Dean Professor Frederick earned her PhD in cultural anthropology at Duke University. She continued her work as a postdoctoral fellow at Princeton University's Center for the Study of Religion and at the Interdenominational Theological Center's Office of Black Women in Church and Society. Frederick is the author or co-author of four books and several articles, including Between Sundays, Black Women and Everyday Struggles of Faith with University of California Press, and Colored Television, American Religion Gone Global with Stanford University Press. She does ethnographic studies that examine issues at the intersections of race, religion, activism, and media. In 2007, she co-authored a book entitled Local Democracy Under Siege, Activism, Public Interests, and Private Politics with NYU Press, which won the Best Book Award for the Society for the Anthropology of North America. Her co-authored text, Televised Redemption, Black Religious Media and Racial Empowerment with NYU Press, examines how black Christians, Muslims, and Hebrew Israelites use media for the redemption of the race. Frederick's ongoing research interests include the study of religion and media, religion and race, and the sustainability of black institutions in a, quote, post-racial world. She is currently curating, alongside five co-editors, an encyclopedia of the histories of historically black colleges and universities. Frederick has served in numerous capacities in her guilds, including as president of the Association of Black Anthropologists, and most recently, as president of the American Academy of Religion, the world's largest association of scholars in religious studies and related fields. This illustrious career so far, with much more to come, um, and much more that I've neglected to mention just for the sake of time, make Dean Professor Frederick a worthy recipient of this award. Beyond all of the accolades and the things that you see on her CV, I have long been an admirer of her for her scholarship, for her service to the academy, for her leadership. 
but also to who she, for who she is as a person, as someone who constantly tries to recognize those whose voices have long been marginalized, who's a person of character, a person of calm wisdom, who can command a room with both sincerity and kindness, but also get people going in the right direction. Her dedication to research, to service, and to community outreach all make her incredibly worthy. And it is my honor to present the Banyak Institute's inaugural Senior Scholar Award to Dean Professor Marla F. Frederick. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. So I want to first start by thanking um, Elaine and the Boniac Institute staff for their warm hospitality and for honoring me with this inaugural Boniac Institute Senior Scholar Award. It is a deep honor and privilege. So thank you, Elaine. Thank you all also for this warm Southern hospitality. I have been thoroughly welcomed to Texas and I'm grateful for that. And I feel as though I have so much more to do. And so I received this award as encouragement to continue the work that's laid before me and truly the work that's laid before all of us as scholars of religion. The issues um, facing our world today are dire and the need for the work that we do as religion scholars and you all do here at the Boniac Institute um, to translate that work to a larger public is really more critical than ever. You know, I've said many times as Dean of Harvard Divinity School in these last couple of months, um, the Divinity School is a multi-religious divinity school where we teach every tradition from Christianity to Islam to Judaism, to Buddhism, to Hinduism, to African traditional religions, to Native American religions, um, that we live in a multiracial and multi-religious world. And our ability to hold these two things in honor together is what will determine the future of our democracy and the potential for democracy around the world. The ideal of democracy is that everyone gets a vote and everyone has a voice. The things we label today as culture wars, from the banning of books to the fierce debates over the border, are rooted in questions of representation, knowledge, and power. Whose presence matters? Whose stories matter? And who will have the power to make those decisions. There's a way in which we as scholars of religion can take for granted the idea that everyone holds dear the values of pluralism and tolerance. But there are people who are not interested in and fiercely opposed to what we call a multicultural democracy. They're often bedrock, these are often bedrock ideals in the humanities and in the social sciences in particular. Indeed, as a form of practice, we scholars of religion work to think about the makings of our diverse religious worlds, the, the sordid histories, the sacred texts, the communities, the power and the resources, the affinities that make for religious devotion and care. We are intimately invested in not only understanding religion, but understanding its impact in our everyday lives. I have been asked tonight uh, to share in the next few moments reflections on my own research over the years and how it has contributed to the public understanding of religion. And so in some ways, this is for me a walk down memory lane. But some thoughts added about the peculiarity of the moment in which I find my own scholarship and religious scholarship in general. I must first start by saying this year has been anything but normal for me. And it's hard for me to pretend as though it has been normal. In January, our beloved newly inaugurated president, Claudine Gay, 
was forced to resign as a part of a larger whirlwind of attacks on what is often characterized as liberal higher education. Indeed, its openness to the work of pluralism, the questions of inclusion, and the process of belonging have been the foundation of much of the attacks. It was indeed a religious conflict emerging from the events of October 7th and President Gay's response to charges of anti-Semitism on Harvard's campus that sparked the initial calls for her ouster, followed by accusations of plagiarism that though dubious, all landed so easily and readily in the public imagination on a black and female body presumed to be already unqualified in the first place to lead the nation's oldest and most storied institution. The narrative fit the stereotype. And so we lost our president on January 2nd, my first day on the job, in the crosshairs of racial and religious conflict. Book ending the resignation of our college president, for me, however, on a more per personal note, were the deaths of my beloved parents. My father passed unexpectedly on August 30th, just six days after the announcement of my deanship. And my mother passed on January 23rd, the day after joining me in Boston for a welcome celebration at Harvard in my honor. She went to sleep that night and simply did not wake up the next morning. Their deaths have been profoundly devastating. And so this year, I have sat in great grief as I watched the events of October 7th unfold and its aftermath. So many mothers and fathers killed, so many children orphaned, so many loved ones gone. The deaths in Israel and Gaza set upon my heart as grief upon grief. And yet they simultaneously underscored for me the fierce urgency of the work that we do in the study of religion. And so even in the midst of my grief, I also sit in tremendous gratitude for the work that I do and for my parents whose lives set me on this journey. My life and my work are a tribute to them, to who they have nurtured me to be, my deep love of black institutions for which I have developed the majority of my career, devoted the majority of my career researching, the black church, black colleges and universities, black businesses, is a direct result of who they are and have always been to me. Raised in a black Baptist church in South Carolina, my parents cultivated my character between our home and church meetings, Sunday school, vacation Bible school, Girl Scouts, revival meetings, where we sang with the junior choir visiting churches all across South Carolina. Sometimes old wooden structures where elders still played the washboard to keep the rhythm. And in the low country where they clapped in a syncopation, syncopation held over from Africa and cultured, cultivated in the Gullah culture of the Sea Islands. Once it was time for me to leave home and attend college, as I weighed my options between the large state university and a small black private HBCU, my father declared that I would be successful anywhere I went, while my mother insisted that I needed a black college experience. My mother's voice and wisdom won out. Educated at historically black colleges and universities, both earning their MBAs from Atlanta University in the 1960s, they were committed to black businesses, not only as a means of providing for their family, but their, their professors at Atlanta University had instilled in them that the point of their MBA was to help provide economic uplift to the black community by employing black workers. 
My dad's greatest concern as he aged was what would happen to his employees if he ever closed his business. He worked until the very end. As I think on my life and research, I am indebted to them for the insistence that I not only learn from black institutions, but that I hold them in the highest regard for what they have given in the midst of such great hostility and with so comparatively few resources to support them. Thus, as an anthropologist of religion, I have been most interested in not necessarily the theological questions, what does God say? Or the biblical questions, what do the scriptures say about God? No, necessarily in ethics, what are the just and moral judgments we should hold based upon our understanding of what we understand God to be saying, but rather the questions that I have asked have had to deal with the understanding of religion's impact on society. Not merely what do traditions say they believe, but how does what they say they believe impact our everyday lives? And what are the socio-political economic conditions that shape and animate these outcomes? This question has informed my scholarship ever since I graduated from Spelman College, where I took my first anthropology course with the first anthropologist I ever met, Dr. Janetta B. Cole, who at the time served as our college president. I told her that in graduate school, I wanted to study anthropology and the black church. And she said to me very, very matter-of-factly, my dear Spellman Sister Marla, if you should decide to go to graduate school and study the black church, you will never be able to go to church again <laughs> and worship in the same way. She knew that bringing a social scientific lens to the study of religion would force me to ask questions and observe things that I wouldn't be inclined to do as a mere practitioner, that my place of worship would become my place of scientific inquiry. I see my work in three phases, black religion and black community life, and then the study of black religion and media, and finally, the study of black religion and education with a focus on historically black colleges and universities. Um, and so I wanna talk about each of these areas and the questions that they leave us to ponder as we consider the intersections of religion and public life and our commitment to religious tolerance. Between Sundays, my first ethnography asked questions about the role of religion and the lives of women who live in and amongst the po poverty in rural North Carolina. In that text, I argued that the faith experiences of women are not solely nor primarily based upon what happens during Sunday morning worship, but rather faith animates and informs the broader scope of women's personal and political decisions faced throughout the week. Their religious practice informs in part their responses to the pressures of economic restructuring taking place in a neoliberal economic and political order where the government is no longer responsible for personal, for, for the issues that one faces, and the market is seen as the answer to all problems. I ask questions like, how does religious practice shape or challenge the conditions under which people live in rural communities when they don't have running water, when their local chamber of commerce sells industrialized hog farming as economic development for the poorest areas of the county? or where the predominantly white school district in the city enjoys decent funding while the two predominantly black school districts in the county made up of the poorest residents are chronically underfunded. How does religion respond to these social crises? And what particular has the black church done in response to these issues given its long history in the civil rights movement? In this space, I found religion and activism not necessarily in the church, but in the community organizations established beyond the church. These were alternative spaces that allowed community members to join with like-minded friends from different traditions to organize and protest, 
the hog farms, the loss of black land, the poor treatment of black students. They also organized to set up a health clinic and provide travel to the hospital for elderly members of the community who lived alone after their children left the community for greater economic opportunity. A kind of activist faith in this instance often stood outside the walls of the institutional church, although church spaces often provided the foundations for the moral vision that declared the dignity and value of all human life, as well as the courage to place one's life on the line for the right cause. In this way, it was a precursor to the questions asked during the Black Lives Matter movement. So where is the black church? Between Sundays showed me that when activism is not located in the physical church, it does not mean that people of faith are not fully engaged in the work of social progress. Some as an outgrowth of their faith communities, others as a referendum on their faith communities. At the same time, Between Sundays show me that our understanding of faith, what it means to be Christian, for example, was being redefined by the inundation of 24-hour religious broadcasting. In my interviews with women, it became clear that they were listening to preachers beyond their local context, as pastors like T.D. Jakes, Creflo Dollar, and Joyce Myers became increasingly a part of their spiritual diet. And so secondly, I began to question the intersections of religion and media. In colored television, American Religion Gone Global, I asked a different set of questions that aimed to interpret an experience that I saw growing while conducting research for Between Sundays. And that was the rise of American religious broadcasting as a national and international phenomenon. Here I wanted to understand the impact of religious television in the United States and abroad, especially given the rise of prosperity theologies which promised, as anthropologists Jean and John Komaroff note in their turn of the century text, Millennial, Capitalism, Millennial Capital, that the economic systems of the world were leading to conditions in which people were forced to pursue, quote unquote, wealth without work. The rise in the prosperity gospel came, they note, alongside the dramatic rise in gambling worldwide. Lack of access to living wages, given the shifting economic conditions in poorer nations and the increasing wealth gap in richer nations produced conditions under which everyday citizens felt a need to capture wealth sans work. But prosperity was not the only outgrowth of religious broadcasting. An attention to personal transformation over systemic transformation has defined the era of religious broadcasting. Whether related to one's health or wealth, the promise of change lay in the power of individual faith, not in restructuring government or government policies as the civil rights movement had advocated. These changes took place alongside the Federal Communications Commission's 1960 decision, which shifted air timing, air time from what was called sustaining time program, where the network or local station meets all or part of the cost of producing and broadcasting the program in order to serve a public good. So airtime was given away freely to religious communities in order to serve the public good. They moved from sustaining time programs to what they call paid time programs, where the broadcaster himself or herself meets all the costs of producing and broadcasting the program mainly by raising money from viewers. Mainline churches could not compete in this environment, which gave rise to religious programming where charismatics that could raise money by promising parishioners health and wealth if they sowed seeds into their ministries, or evangelicals could offer a more felt needs approach to ministry that offered guidance akin to self-help, offering advice on everything from marriage and family to finances, through the selling of books and tapes. What has changed in this current moment of internet religion has been almost equally dramatic as religious conservatives have revamped 
these earlier commitments that in theory shied away from government intervention into people's personal lives to a religious zeal that sees government, not personal faith, as the answer to ending abortion, curtailing progress on LGBTQIA concerns, banning books, while providing freedom for gun access. Abetted ironically by social media, this vision of religious conservatism forces us to ask new questions as the role of social media becomes ever more entangled in our practice of religion and our pursuit of democracy. The internet, as a number of scholars have observed, has democratized our access to information, creating a context in which everyone is able to become an expert, even without study. Our understanding of media is critical to our ability to understand the role of religion in public life. If in the 1960s it ushered in the age of personalized faith that saw the solution to one's problems as an individual matter, matter what will today's internet faith in its multiple forms usher in? How has social media informed our response even to the war in Gaza, for example? as images of the brutality of the invasion of October 7th and the aftermath in Gaza are live streamed to our telephones, bypassing the normal filtered channels of what once was called the evening news. How do those new questions coming from those images create internet, internet influencers, political activists, who are then able to dictate the terms under which compromise is or is not made with political decision makers or even university presidents. Who then is in charge of framing the debate? These are questions that contemporary scholars of religion and media must wrestle with. And finally, my attention to religion and education has allowed me to explore the religious foundations of historically black colleges and universities. These HBCUs were founded in the aftermath of the Civil War and largely between the time of Reconstruction and 1915 to educate recently freed um, persons and their descendants who were not allowed to attend predominantly white institutions. They were founded largely by black religious denominations, white abolitionists, missionaries, and philanthropists from the North and by the federal government through the establishment of black land grant institutions. While challenging the paradigm as too binary, not giving space for nuance, overlap, and change over time, the fundamental idea that black religion embodies, at least in part, some element of protest remains. In his canonical text, Black Religion and Black Radicalism, for example, Gabriel Wilmore frames Black radicalism almost exclusively in terms of faith-inspired slave revolts and movements for civil rights and Black power. Education, strikingly, as protest, as radical, as counter to the establishment order, established order, rarely shows up. I want to reframe our understanding of the building of black educational institutions by black religious organizations as radical, countercultural, and central to the pursuit of justice sought by black religious leaders. And I contend that the visionary hope that inspired their longev longevity came not simply from the male leaders and spokesmen of these colleges, but also, and in many cases, primarily from the many women who without name recognition secured and undergirded the work of these schools. Interestingly, I came to an early understanding of this idea, the central role of women in the building of HBCUs, through conversations with my father about his tenure as business manager at Morris College. On the occasion of his 75th birthday, I conducted interviews with him and developed a short documentary that told the story of his life and work at the college. In subsequent interviews, he and Jim Solomon, who served as dean of the college at the time, um, they told the story and the story unfolds clearly. While he talks in interviews about the influence of President O.R. Rubin on his ability to attend Mars, it was my father insists 
women like the president's wife, Anna D. Rubin, and her contingent of women fundraisers through the Women's Auxiliary of the State Baptist Convention, who ensured the college's financial viability. My dad would say about fundraising for the college, he said, if we were trying to raise $50,000 to build a building on campus, he said, I would talk to the black Baptist ministers and I'd tell them we need $50,000 for this, this building. And he said, they'd say, well, bro Frederick, we'll pledge 50 and give what we can. He said, but whenever he talked to the women, whenever he talked to Anna D. Rubin or Beatrice Sanders or Ms. Margaret Davis, he said it would be like money in the bank. <laughs> His observations lie in conjunction with the scholarship on black institutions. W.E.B. Du Bois once opined, quote, quote, despite the noisier and more spectacular advance of my brothers, I instinctively feel and know that it is the five million women of my race who really count. Near the turn of the 20th century, Du Bois had estimated that women raised nearly three-fourths of the money used to acquire church property. I am interested in these histories because of these women. And secondly, I am interested in these histories because of the role of white missionaries in the founding of historically black colleges and universities. Many of them who moved to the South and were harassed and intimidated for their work amongst poor blacks in the South. And because of the history of interracial collaboration demonstrated in the development of these schools. Today, for instance, the United Methodist Church still supports the largest number of historically black colleges and universities than any other denomination, white or black, at 11. The history of the graduate programs at these schools in places like Howard's, Howard University's Law School or Clark Atlanta University's Business School reflects that these places served as interracial and interreligious spaces long before civil rights movement advancement. Jewish scholars, for, for example, often taught at HBCUs when they were not afforded opportunities in predominantly white spaces. And several Jewish lawyers graduated from Howard Law School. In addition, if you look at a picture from my parents' class at Atlanta University, you will see a number of Southeast Asians and Africans amongst the student body. Again, this is before people from black and brown nations could more readily gain admission into PWIs. This long history of interracial and interreligious collaboration is something to explore, especially in thinking about the ways in which HBCUs have and continue to contribute to the making of the American democratic ideal even beyond their production of political leaders like Representative Jim Clyburn or the contingent of political leaders in Georgia where I have lived um, recent, most recently, who some see as on the front lines of securing democracy, gubernatorial candidate Stacey Abrams is a graduate of Spelman College, Senator Raphael Warnock, a graduate of Morehouse, College. Um, Prosecutor uh, Fannie Lewis, a graduate of Howard University, former mayor, Atlanta, of, mayor of Atlanta, Keisha Lance Bottom, Bottoms, a graduate of Florida A&M University. This research, for me, sits at the very intersection of questions around religion, pluralism, and the work of religion in the public sphere. How might we consider HBCUs as exemplars in the creation of multiracial and multi-religious learning spaces in the United States? How might we understand their contributions to the building of American democracy as central and indispensable to that project rather than as an addendum to the project? And to what extent do we owe these colleges more than lip service in the way we honor their commitments to the ideals of democracy that we hold so dear? These and a host of other questions animate my own ongoing interest in the study of religion and American culture. 
In closing, I'd like to share a clip um, from this documentary that I mentioned about my dad on the occasion of his, that I created on the occasion of his 75th birthday. After playing, I look forward to your questions and our ongoing ruminations about the value of the study of religion and the questions of pluralism and tolerance that come from it, and the truly important work of the Boniac Institute in this moment in our nation's history. Thank you.